I, I don't come up here much because when you finish your mission, you, it's best to kind of let others fill that void and, and move on. <laughs> and um, but I always, when I come back, I'm uh, all sorts of memories kind of rush into my life because this was uh, I got to be governor at a really purposeful time. I think um, it was a interesting time because the other party, generally the Democrats, were had been in control for since the beginning of the creation of the state, more or less. Uh, and um, I got to be this rookie governor with some very veteran members of the legislature. And uh, Tony Jennings and John Thrasher embraced our agenda. My agenda became theirs, and we worked on it together. And it created a really interesting environment that um, I learned quickly that it's important the success you have will stall out. It's kind of, there must be some like law of physics here that if you're not moving forward, inertia sets in and ultimately you begin to atrophy. In policy, the same thing applies. So um, what I learned uh, through trial and error is that never play defense, always play offense. Big ideas are really important. It seems so weird to talk about this. It, it, Ten years ago, it would have been accepted. Everybody kind of nod their heads. Now. Big ideas get you primaried. Uh, big ideas are a pain in the ass because you know a bunch of people are swarming on top of you. Big ideas can be distorted by people that want to protect the status quo. You see what goes on in Washington, D.C., and, and no ideas are basically the norm there. Um, they struggle to do the things that, that I hope you all um, consider really an important part of what you, who you are and what you do. You get to serve for eight years in the House of Representatives you can make a huge difference. Um, and it's not, it, it, it really, it, you can move the needle on so many areas of policy. Um, and we've proven it over and over again. The talent that exists in the, in the Florida legislature, now that I get to travel around the country and talk to um, members of the legislature a lot about, about, um, about education reform in particular, is as good as any place in the, in the country. And the work that you all have done in passing meaningful legislation is as good as any place in the country as well. So don't let atrophy set in. Continue to play offense. Um, take, the, take the hit along the way. You'll look back on your service and say, you know, it was a lot more fun, it was a lot more purposeful, a lot more meaningful to be bigger and bolder than to say, hey, I'm a state representative and not really have much other than the lapel pin on your, on your suit. Uh, you'll look back on it with fond memories, just as I have uh, as governor of the state for eight years. So, I'm happy to be back. Uh, I want to, um, <coughs> Jose, thank you and Baleka and the, um, the folks, uh, and of course the speaker for the extraordinary uh, bill that got passed last year. Uh, you know you're doing the right thing when you get sued by school districts. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, superintendents, I think, and certainly the, the uh, teachers union. It was a historic bill. It was extraordinary. Uh, and for those that, you know, the sausage was made in a, the sausage is always going to look ugly while you're making it. It's the end product that matters. And you all did work that uh, I'm sure you got a little grief back home occasionally. It's a couple of grumpy people that may not have completely understood the bill. But the ramifications of this will be long lasting. So whatever the next thing is, I hope you think as big as uh, uh, the House bill that I think is going to make a huge difference for a lot of children that now will be able to, their parents will have a lot more choices than they otherwise would have had. So thanks. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> so, so Governor, working with staff here in the House over the last few years, it's always been amazing to me uh, how often your name comes up when we're talking about doing things and, and, and how fondly they, they, uh, they speak of you. I have, I have one anecdote that I, I want to bring up uh, that happened to me a few years ago. Uh, I had opposed uh, some mechanism to create funding for, for uh, an institution down in South Florida along with the rest of the Dade delegation. Uh, but for whatever reason, I got signaled out and, and pretty savaged in the paper. Now, I had heard that Governor Bush would answer all his emails. Uh, and so one Saturday I'm sitting at home and uh, the pressure was particularly high and I emailed him and I said, Governor, I'd, uh, if you got a minute, I'd like to talk to you. Let me know when you'd be available. And he emailed back within 10 minutes and said, how about now? And put his cell phone uh, on the email. 
So I called them up and I said, look, this is going on. And, you know, the Herald's saying this and these people are saying that. And, and he says to me, uh, he says, uh, do you believe in what you're doing? And I said, yeah. He says, is it the right thing to do? And I said, yeah, of course. He says, so what's the question? Amen. And that was the end of that. Um, <laughs> uh, so what was that uh, institute? I remember now. What was, what was it? It was Miami-Dade College. Yeah. Uh, Sacred. And it's a great institution. And <laughs> it's, you know, it, the... Being, being critical of something they're doing is not always popular down in yeah. our hometown. But, but it certainly spoke a lot uh, to, to the kind of leadership that so many people are fond of here. So uh, just for historical purposes, let's start from the beginning. You, know, you get elected governor, there's not a single charter school in the entire state. Uh, walk us through what starting this, this path was like. Well, the charter schools, um, I lost in 94. And um, it, was a, it was the most extraordinary race I ever ran, actually. It was an um, incredible race, and I, I lost. I was one of, I think Bit Romney and I were the only two candidates that lost in a statewide race in a 1994 wave election. And um, I decided to create a think tank, do tank, basically. And we, we were the leading advocates for the passage of a charter school law, uh, which took a couple of years. In 1996, it was passed. Jim Scott uh, was the president of the Senate, and he single-handedly um, pushed this agenda uh, to, his, to his credit. And four schools were set up in 1997. Um, the Liberty City Charter School was one of them. Uh, Arby Holmes School that still exists today here uh, in this same zip code. Uh, the Seaside School, I can't remember the name of it, and one other school. And um, we were you know, pioneers because it had never been done before. At that point, there were, there were charter schools in other states, but not, not at the scale we have today any place. So it was a brand new effort. Um, John Hage, who was uh, working in our foundation, uh, became the most knowledgeable person on the planet about charter schools. I mean, he was like the encyclopedia. Uh, and we, we, took, we tried to take the best from every, every state. Since then, the laws have gotten better. But the legislature passed it, and we went at it. We had no funding, no capital outlay dollars, no funding, a, a resistant school district. It was, uh, it was a huge struggle. We got used computers. Um, everything was borrowed or, or um, donated, basically. Uh, we had a pre-K uh, place was, our, was the site of our school. The kids wore uniforms. It was totally parent-driven. We recruited the parents. We, um, uh, we would have every Saturday morning, we would, we would go into uh, uh, the Urban League's um, conference room, if you will, or a church in, this, in the same community, and we would just, we recruited our parents one by one. It was a blast. It was the most, it was the hardest work I've ever done. It's a lot easier passing laws than actually taking a law and turning it into a, a school, for sure. The, the, difficult, the difficulty of, of, uh, of charter schools is the way the debate has been framed. Uh, but, but you've said many times, and, and the speaker has said it endless amounts of times, as has Chair Diaz and Baleka, uh, that a charter school is a public school. Oh, yeah. Take and all so, comers. Uh, the, the, this challenge that happens and, and the, uh, the arguments around uh, why a public education must be given to children through this industrial education complex. Uh, walk us through a little of how that becomes such a dichotomy. Well, I mean, his, the history of education is, has always been there's, there's people have always embraced neighborhood schools. They, you know, school-based management, all these, the, these, this terminology has always been with us. A charter school is a totally, you know, school-based public school. The principal runs the school. Uh, there is a, you know, parental involvement. Parents choose, but you have to take all comers. It's what schools should look like. And envision, in, and instead of like in our, our home county, uh, one of my, Patricia Levesque here, and she'll roll her eyes when I say this, but it drives me nuts that the collective bargaining process takes the, the labor costs for schools and it's a plugged item. So a principal basically, it's not a neighborhood school, it's not school based, when you have no say on uh, the amount of money spent. So in every school district, Bill, in, in the fancier parts of Sarasota, 
teachers will migrate because of collective bargaining towards their neighborhood schools where their p kids may go to school, where the schools may be perceived to be safer. They have higher salaries, and the net effect is you have this big disparity. Well, charter schools don't that. You get, a, you get an amount of money and you spend it uh, by hiring your personnel, and you have to have a lot more innovation to make that happen. Every school, what do you call it a you know, traditional public school, every school should have a budget and you should buy your teachers based on that budget. That means that the, the, the student, you know, the teacher that's coming from Bethune-Cookman or University of Florida or any of our schools of education aren't assigned to the toughest uh, places to teach right off the bat, get disheartened and leave. Not every freshman or fir first year teacher should be in the toughest environment. They ought to be at Palmetto High School, you know. They ought to be in Pinecrest Elementary in our, in our community as well. That doesn't exist today. It's a, it, it's a dirty little secret and I think it's totally inappropriate. So charter schools, charterizing the, the entire school system would be a brilliant idea and it would bring, um, I think it would bring much better um, balance in how, how schools operate. I would trust a principal, a proven principal that's a charismatic leader over anybody outside that school about creating the right environment for children to learn. So, so when, when you began as governor, we were last in education by all measurable... Well, uh, graduation rate we were, yeah. Uh, Couldn't even whisper, thank God for, you know, fill in the blank for the neighboring state. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and, and so, so today we lead the nation through efforts of yours and, and, and leaders that have come afterwards. Uh, why, why do you think it is still such a debate when the empirical evidence is so vast? You know, it's, uh, this, this fight will be eternal. It's never going to stop. If you're looking for uh, education policy, if you're doing bigger and bolder things, if you're looking for uh, just uh, peace offerings to break out, it's never going to happen. In, in a system where the adult economic interests are the principal driver of what you all do. So the funding formula generates the salaries for the people that work in the schools. They hire people to come up here and make their case. I'm, I'm not critical of that, uh, nor should you be critical of it. You should respect the fact that their economic interests are what drive that decision. They're not as focused on student learning. That's not their job. Their job is to represent the employees of school districts and teachers in, in the schools. So I'm, that's never going to go away. The collective bargaining process doesn't work really well if you totally decentralize the, the learning experience, does it? Who are you going to collectively bargain with? You know, it takes away that, that uh, essential element of why they exist. So that tension will always exist. Um, the, the opposition to reform is significantly less today than it was when we started, trust me. Uh, I mean, when, when the legislature passed the first statewide voucher bill in the United States, and I signed it into law, uh, that afternoon, this was done at Raw Middle School, we signed the bill. Uh, into law and within a minute it, the lawsuit started and the fight continued and people school recognition dollars which have never been cut and, and ho hopefully uh, they, they never will be is the largest bonus uh, program for teachers in the United States. Uh, all of those at first the, the teachers union opposed 130 million maybe it was 110 or 20 million dollars going almost all of it to teachers. I mean, This is how bad the opposition was uh, so it's subsided significantly, but also atrophy has set in a little bit. But for this bill that you all passed and the governor signed into law that's going to create, I think, a, a renaissance for charter schools particularly, and a lot of our other really good ideas, we, our outcomes have flatlined. We had a big gain because we graded schools A through F, we rewarded teachers when there was improvement in the, the school grade or, or, or uh, schools were graded A. We eliminated social promotion. We put reading coaches in every school to teach teachers how to teach reading because if you want to be focused on something really important, the schools of education aren't bringing teachers into the classroom that are, that are capable of taking on this really important challenge. In fact, we created alternative certification because of that and there are more alternatively certified teachers in, in the state uh, than the traditional certification route. We turned the whole system upside down and the net result was we had big surges and gains, but it's flatlined. And I think, it, to me, the lesson is reform is never complete. Uh, you've got to, I mean, we have, we have problems 
uh, with middle school. I think there ought to be a real focus on making sure that uh, there's relevancy in middle school and high schools. It's never, uh, you just can't rest on your laurels. Think about it, 10 years ago, a, you know, a, a kid was in second grade is now gonna be a senior. So if you, if you don't constantly improve uh, how you go about this, you end up creating huge numbers of students that really get a mediocre education. So it's gotta be just constant. Um, and I think there's more openness to now f for this. There's the, 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 those that oppose uh, reform are more resigned uh, that particularly the House of Representatives in, the, in, the, uh, in Florida, they're gonna, they're gonna take it to the hoop. One other thing that's really important, Jose, is that we, our foundation was predicated on the belief that the Florida story was worthy of sharing with the rest of the country. Now, we've gone beyond that and are focusing on other policy areas, but people look to Florida to this day, without a doubt. The, the, the innovations that you have embedded in the bill that you passed this last year, are, I can tell you, we get calls every day from legislators, uh, secretaries of education, governors, uh, people that are really interested in, in what Florida does, whether it's virtual learning with the Florida Virtual School being by far and away the largest, the voucher program, the corporate tax scholarship program, ESAs, the Gardner uh, program, McKay, all of these things people look to, ending social promotion. States are now applying elements of the, uh, the Florida story and having success. So don't, no, no pressure, but you know, the minute we stop innovating and reforming, then we stop being a leader that others, others want to emulate. Well, and, and Governor, you, uh, not just your legacy of choice in education, but also uh, the, the foundation that you started turned 10 years old and now it's doing work, as you said, all around the country. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the obstacles and things that you deal with in other parts of the country in, in trying to get this kick started. Well, they're not dissimilar. Um, do you, you, you have to have a governor that's willing to take risks. There are fewer governors today that are willing to take risks, I would say. You know, it's, I don't know why it is, it's just we're in this period where uh, the rewards for doing bigger things aren't perceived. It, it's disappointing to me beyond belief that policy doesn't matter to the extent that uh, demonizing, I mean, th this is a DC problem more than anything else, but the contagion has spread uh, a little bit to other places as well. You guys and gals get elected to do things, not to beat the crap out of your opponent and demonize whoever disagrees with you. You're, you're here to serve, and if you have a servant's heart, you wanna do things on behalf of the people that you represent. And um, that means taking some risks on their, on their side, you know, on their behalf, and when things aren't working, to improve the things. So we're in a climate where not every governor embraces that idea, and therefore, and, but some legislatures are. So we, we kind of, depending on where, where the state is, we have a different strategy to encourage uh, the legislatures to be bigger and bolder or to embrace the ideas of the governor that are already bigger and bolder. So it's, it's different, but um, it's a struggle. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. If we weren't, you know, what we ought to start doing is, whether it's the child welfare system or environmental policy or economic development, um, whatever the subject matter is that's close to your heart, you ought to have the, the passion to say, if we weren't doing it this way, how would we do it? If you, if you start that way, then you, you get people thinking, you, if you think we should change to, to make things better, then you're playing offense, the other people that are you know, protecting the status quo are playing defense. If you don't start with that premise though, you end up like just, just touching on the margins, and that's not what this should be about. So different parts of the country have different mentalities about that. Um, Florida still is a leader. There are other states that uh, are, are pretty engaged in, in efforts. The education savings account bill that passed, Governor Ducey's all in on reform, not just on education but across the board. That would be a place uh, where um, the, the policy is really invigorated. Brian Sandoval passed an ESA bill, but he didn't put it in the funding formula, as I recall, and so it's now you know, a daily, he lost the legislature, they cut the budget, and off we go. So um, finding ways to make this sustainable and over the long haul requires leadership both in the le legislature and in um, the governor's office. Final thing I'd say is one of the challenges, particularly on K, think about K-12 
or higher ed reform as well, which I think is essential. Uh, you're asking people that oppose your ideas to implement your ideas. <laughs> just think about that just for a brief moment. That's not, you, you gotta, I mean, you have, to, you have to use your oversight powers and the, you know, the executive has to be just pounding tables and knocking heads. And when I was governor, we had uh, the dreaded A-plus meeting past the A-plus plan and every other week, more or less, we would have the, you know, the, the folks at the Department of Education and policy advisors would come in and I would say, what are we doing? How are we doing this? What's the timing? What's the, you know, just bam, 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 bam. Because if you don't do that, laws, laws aren't, aren't enforced. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, <laughs> if you're not all in on the, on the implementation, then actually reform is harder to do. Think about it. If you, you pass the big deal, you take all the risks, you get all the crap, uh, from people that oppose it, and then you pass it on to the executive, and the executive, I'm not saying that's the case here, just for the record, because I know there's people in the press, but if the executive doesn't faithfully implement the intent of the law, then the next time you try to do a big reform, you say, well, it didn't work. Well, maybe it didn't work because you didn't try, and that's, that's what I think is um, essential as well, is that third part of this. Then you create a climate when it's successful that it creates another iteration of reform. So, so along those lines, what's, what's the next big, bold idea? Um, I think the idea of, of education savings accounts where parents are empowered is the big idea. It's the, it's the answer to the question, if you weren't doing it this way, how would you? Well, if we weren't doing it this way, we would, we would empower moms and dads to make these decisions. We would create a level playing field. We would provide... Uh, we would, make, we would make parents informed consumers of the most important decision they make, which is the, the caliber, you know, the, the school that they want their child to attend to. To me, that is the, the, big, the big dog out there to, to embrace. Not an easy thing to do because that's like, that's not pick, you know, sticking a, putting a stick into a wasp nest. That's blowing up the wasp nest and, um, and they, they seem to spread quicker when you do that. So be prepared for some pushback. But I, that, that idea, and then the, the second idea that, I'm, that uh, our foundation works on is how you move to a personalized learning experience. And this, this comes from just hanging out with people that uh, have embraced technology particularly, but this is not just a technological question. Think about a classroom in, a, in any place in, in Florida we have a very diverse group of students. We're 57 percent, we're majority minority, uh, which by the way I don't consider to, that, that to me is kind of irrelevant, uh, but we are 56 or 58 percent uh, school and you know, low, low to moderate income, close to the poverty line. More than half our kids are qualified for free and reduced lunch. That's, that's, a, that's a challenge. We have kids with learning disabilities, we have children that are gifted, and we have kids in between. So we have this very diverse student population, and we homogenize, in effect what we do is we make our teachers teach to the median. Now, what else can they do? You got 19 kids or 21 kids, if they're not cheating on the constitutional amendment, uh, and they have to teach to the three or four kids that are in the middle. It's very hard to customize the learning experience unless you harness technology and you allow children to learn in their own way at their own pace with their age group perhaps moving up the learning experience. But in, imagine a, a state that would make or a school district that would commit to this and be totally committed to it. You would have students that would graduate starting out as maybe, you know, sophomores or halfway through their sophomore year in college. You would have students that other, otherwise would be sixth grade level readers or seventh or eighth grade level readers that would have to master the material until they moved on, which means that they'd have a fighting chance to, to live a life of purpose and meaning. If not, I don't think 10 years from now that a student that's a seventh grade level reader graduating, by the way they do still in Florida, graduating high school, will be able to get a job ever. Ever. I mean, we are moving with technology to functional obsolescence for a whole wide array of, of people in our state unless we get this right. And I think so, 
more, more choices for parents, ultimately the ESA model I think is the best one, and moving to this customized, personalized learning model where you're, you're you know, you're, it's a traditional classroom, but envision how you could use um, technology to assure that the high achieving kid is pushed, not held back. The low achieving kid masters the material before they're pushed along and, and, and tragically end up with these huge learning gaps. And the kids in the middle get, get a learning experience that's rigorous and exciting as well. And all of it should be towards college and career readiness, which once again, Florida is one of the leaders in. So opening up an array of, of learning experiences for young people that make not just college relevant, where you're college ready, because a third of our kids are, despite our gains, uh, Jose, a third of our kids in the country are, are truly college ready. They, they don't have to take remedial math and, and reading when they go to community college or, or a state university. Uh, and career ready, which um, then the transformation of our economy, a four-year degree is going to be less relevant for a whole lot of students. And their earnings potential will be a lot higher uh, if they have a, they get a high school degree that may allow them to get an AS degree, or they could get an AS degree while they're getting their high school degree, but they also have a nationally recognized certificate that says they've learned something of relevance to be able to get a job. That, if we were starting over, that would be the ideal kind of system. And so a, a revolutionary idea, I think, is moving to this personalized learning uh, environment. Our foundation is working on this. This is not easy. Imagine funding formulas, imagine seat time, you know, imagine all of the stasis that exists in our K-12 system, and this is a radical departure. But the world we're moving into, I think, demands it and requires it. And you mentioned funding there at the end. Uh, every year, ultimately, it comes down to are we investing in our schools? That's the big, that's the big popular debate is if you just throw more money at it, then that means you care more about education than others. Uh, but it's yeah. been proven uh, money doesn't solve all problems clearly. No, I, I think one of the lessons, uh, I don't know if uh, Joanne Lesnoff's here, but I, I was really lucky to get to work with some <laughs> extraordinarily talented people in, in the um, Office of Policy and Budget. And what we, the mantra um, that we learned together was fund your first priorities first. You know, fund your, if you want to reform things, fund the reforms. Um, that should be the first priority. So if you have an attitude that you're, you're basically kind of, you're moving towards a zero-based budget and you're adjusting your, your funding towards the things you want more of, money's good. But if you're just funding the beast without reforms attached to it, um, you, you get a bad result. I mean, I was watching, uh, yes, I do watch Morning Joe for 45 minutes. <laughs> That's about all I can take. Uh, and the governor of New Jersey was on, the newly elected governor, all excited. I, I've, I've been to that movie, it's an exciting time. And he's saying that, you know, this, we've, we've had a period where we've underfunded the schools in New Jersey. What? Are you kidding me? I mean, they, they, Newark has $25,000 per student. There are school districts that are complete failures that are in that level. I mean, the notion that somehow money is the answer to everything is, is just crazy. Now, low-income kids in New Jersey don't do as well as low-income kids in Florida. Hispanic kids in New Jersey don't do as well as our Hispanic kids. Kids with learning disabilities do better here. And we have probably one half of the funding per student that they have in New Jersey. So, Governor-elect Murphy, um, you know, hope you, hope you enjoy your service, but if you're gonna go and try to convince people in New Jersey they're not spending enough, uh, the problem in New Jersey is a problem that we have confronted uh, successfully, which is they have not confronted the sins of the past. So I'm, I don't know what the classroom monies are going into the New, Jer New Jersey schools. It might look closer to what goes, goes on here. So all of the decisions made by the political hacks uh, in concert with the public unions in New Jersey have created this huge per student funding, but it doesn't get the results. So Jose, you're absolutely right. I mean, you cannot allow the narrative to be built that money is the answer to this. Money may fund your you know, wrong ideas to over, you know, over fund, overspend on your pensions and never, never fund the pension uh, correctly. But at some point that, that, uh, that's gonna be devastating for New Jersey. You see the downgrade in their 
in their um, bond ratings because of their pension, pension obligations are way out of whack. Um, this legislature, Florida's legislature and governors have been pretty vigilant about not letting that happen. Well, I, I want to let people ask some questions that I'm sure they have as well, but the, the speaker told me before we did this, uh, you know, I don't want softballs, I want it to be hard hitting. And so, uh, and so the question, the question that the question everybody wants to know is, is the U back? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> Hell yeah, they're back. <laughs> I'm very cautious though, um, having been governor and watched uh, FSU and and in uh, the University of Florida win national championships and celebrating, for the record, being a shameless supporter of the state, I'm very cautious about. Um, getting cocky, Miami cocky about this because uh, we got a new coach, he's instilling a, uh, a, uh, a, humility, in, a humility into his players. Uh, they're enthusiastic, they obviously love what they're doing, they're playing phenomenally well. But this year in college football, I would not say, we're not, I'm not gonna do a you dance on you. We got, we got three more games before we get into the playoffs. All right, can we go to some questions? Can I tell, I gotta tell one story about football. I, I uh, two quick stories. I was, I was uh, watching FSU play uh, Miami at Doak Campbell Stadium. And um, I did the halftime interview with whoever was, uh, was the broadcasters there. And the guy says, well, you know, of course you're neutral because you're governor. I said, no, I'm not neutral, I'm for the Canes. And I literally, you could hear the crowd boo. They were all listening on their radios. That was a good move on my part. Uh, and the second, the second story, uh, my good friend John Thrasher invited me. He said, you gotta come, man. You're the governor of the state. We won the national championship. I think this was 99. Uh, so it was a beautiful, uh, crisp day in January, as Tallahassee can have, like today, in beautiful weather. So I show up, and I'm wearing I'm totally oblivious to this because I'm like, I, I'm pretty nerdy about the job and I was like all in. I, I didn't really focus on the, the stuff that's supposed to be fun. I was like obsessing about probably the child welfare plan that we had or something like that. So I show up in a, a gator blue sweater <laughs> at the, in front of 15,000 uh, Seminoles and he, he almost tackled me before I walked out and he, he went, the, the concession stand was still open. We stole a uh, darn and gold jacket to cover up the sweater, and I survived another really boneheaded idea. So <laughs> I made a lot of them. Anybody have any questions? Oh, we there we go. Representative Wilhite. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your just being here and your discussion about education. And I think this is an idea about talking about turning education upside down. Would you have an opinion or an idea in comparing us to other countries that has year-round K-12 education? Um, you know, it's a the world that we're in probably requires that uh, at some point to extend the the school year. There are other ideas of extending the school day for certain student populations. Um, I, I worry about inputs kind of driving this, but if we, wouldn't, if we weren't doing it this way, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't have an agricultural calendar and an industrial model in a world that you know, is totally irrelevant to the, to, to the world we live in now and where we're moving towards. So I'd certainly be open to it. Um, you're gonna have to talk to the speaker about funding it. <laughs> and if it's, a, if it's a mandate and you're not prepared to fund it, then that's back, re rewind the tape back to unfulfilled promises make reform tough. We passed, um, the legislature and I, I, was, I was gone, we, well we started it, but the um, uh, Governor Scott's first year I believe in the legislature was all in on uh, bonuses for teachers. How'd that work out? You know, everybody's 98% of the teachers self-assess, I guess, and they're all above average and, uh, and the money, you know, it's just kind of, you've got to be vigilant about making sure that whatever the idea is that you're, you're really committed to um, purposefully uh, implementing it. And that's a big idea for sure that might require 33% increase in funding, at least on my math. Dr. Gonzalez. 
Thank you, Governor. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I heard you speak before about this um, disadvantage, this geographic disadvantage of somebody living near one particular school and not being able to take advantage of another program that might be halfway across the state. And you had seen some things throughout the country that other states have done to widen that possibility and allow that person in geographic area A to benefit from program in geographic area C. I wonder if you could go over some of those uh, innovative ideas that are that are sure. being uh, done in other states and how they could be implemented in the state. Well, of I mean, the the principal way of doing this is course access. You know, where you when you go you go to uh, universities, you're funding by credit hours. Take take a course, you get three credit hours. It's funded by 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 that credit. If you if you envision the high schools, for example, having that same kind of uh, model, then you could, you could have a menu of courses that it might be a community college, it might be an online course uh, provided by the Florida Virtual School. You know, for that matter, if it's high quality, the internet doesn't have geographic boundaries. You know, it might be a Singapore math uh, team that did, are just lights out. If you follow this, uh, Bill Gates is making his poor child um, learn Singapore math. Can imagine having him as a dad be like, <laughs> You know, you have a fighting chance maybe on reading, but math, you're just going to be crushed. So you just do what you're, I guess you do what you're told. But the, the idea is that, that that's available today. But we have to change the law and the funding formula to make sure that you have a wide array of choices. If you define education not in the, you know, a public school system has to be funded and, you know, the little butts in a seat or units of production and you have deputy superintendents and regional this and that, and you have this industrial bureaucracy on top of schools uh, and there's 67 school districts and they all fight to come up here and fight for if you If you turned it on its head and said, what we're organized around here about is making sure that students learn. You move to a child-centered system, then parents should be given informed, they, they need to be informed, they're making a big choice, they need to have information, they need to know what works and what doesn't in an intellectually honest way, uh, we should have high expectations because every child can meet those expectations if you organize the right way. We should reward teachers for the success that they have and get bad teachers out of the classroom as quickly as possible and not be politically correct and say that it's okay that you can have a school where a kid is learning in, in you know, one and a half times more than, a, than the kid in the next classroom and that that's acceptable. It isn't acceptable in the world we're moving towards where we're, we're going to have driverless cars, where, you know, big data mining now makes, uh, this creates this massive surge of productivity, but it also means fewer jobs available unless you have the skills to mine the data. Uh, that's the world we're moving towards, and the system doesn't work. So moving to a course access system, I think, would be uh, a logical step. Now, Florida's begun that process, but we, we've taken a mini-me step. We've not taken a big step. And, and that, would be a, that's a, that would be a third big idea for sure. We don't have to just talk about education we, and the canes. We can. <laughs> Governor, thank you for your service and uh, to the state of Florida and your continued service. Uh, you talked about ESAs, education savings accounts, or education scholarship accounts. I'm familiar with them, very supportive of it, but I'm, I'm not sure that everybody in the audience is. Could you talk about why you think it's going to be as transformative as it will be once we're able to pass just, that here in the Florida legislature? I don't know. I'm, I'm a, I still have libertarian blood running through my veins. I mean, I, I think, who do you trust more, a mom or, you know, the poor person that's doing the FEFP formula? <laughs> you know, I don't know who that is these days, but... <laughs> You know, this very complex funding system that ends up going into, uh, it's a, it's a top-down driven education system. I, would, I believe our country does a lot better when we're a bottom-up country. So instead of getting grumpy about D.C. and how bad everything is in D.C., we should act on our consciousness of, uh, you know, when we, when we see misery around us. Right now, there are people dying because of the opioid crisis. Well, we've confronted this in the past, and I think a Florida solution to this problem is gonna be far better than one that's driven by the White House. No disrespect to the current occupant of the White House, that's not relevant here. What's relevant is 
we solve problems in a bottom-up way. We empower people and we get a better result. Well, education is the same principle. If you give people the choice, they may not make the logical choice that the experts you know, would say, well, you're not doing your job right. They may actually move their child to a, to a place where they can work and be one, more than one paycheck away from economic disaster, but it's en route to where that job is and gives them more free time to love their child with their heart and soul. That is a value that is as high as a central planner that is really smart, an expert on what it, you know, the logical optimum may, means by which children should be should taught. Think of a thriving system where all sorts of reasons are the reasons why by parents choose, but they have the economic power to do so. Um, I think that yields a far better result. I, and research suggests this, not just you know, opinion, that private vouchers, corporate tax scholarship programs, the McKay scholarship program, the Gardner scholarship program, does not hurt public, so-called public schools. It doesn't. They get better because everybody responds to these, you know, these market signals. Uh, and and that's, that's what Florida has been a leader in, and I think this next iteration would be, if you, wanna, if you really wanna let the big dog eat, it would be education savings accounts where parents make these choices. Uh, and that the funding is not always subject to debate, that it's part of the funding formula. Well, then, you, then, it, then you're lighting up the scoreboard for a long while, and people will adjust, the adults will adjust to a system like that. All right, just gonna take uh, one last question, Representative Fine. Oh, actually, we'll, we'll take uh, Sullivan afterwards because the microphone was already there, but go ahead, Representative. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Leva. Um, I have a question about a different kind of education. And one of the things that worries me, we're having a bit of a manufacturing resurgence, not only in Florida, around the country, in my area. And what, and what manufacturers are looking for are, frankly, to foster an entrepreneurial culture. Sam Walton was the most successful entrepreneur of all time, didn't have a college degree. And I worry that we're not, we're not giving people the skills. We're sort of putting everyone, say, you should get a degree in liberal arts or mm -hmm. hard sciences in college. What are your thoughts about helping not everyone should go and pursue those things, but what about thinking about the folks who, after they graduate from high school, are ready to be a carpenter or a roofer or work in, a, or work in the new Tesla factory? What are your thoughts about that? Well, they probably won't work in the Tesla factory because it's almost all automated. <laughs> That's the challenge we're facing, but it's to your point. We have, we have six million jobs unfilled that require a certain amount of skills. The number one issue for businesses, particularly manufacturing, but not just manufacturing, is the lack of qualified people. It's not our workers' comp system, although I hope you guys fix it. It's not our taxes, although I hope they have tax reform in, in, DC, you know, in D.C. It's not the level of regulation. President Trump, to his credit, his administration is doing good work there. It's the lack of qualified workers. So moving to a K-20 or lifelong learning kind of environment uh, needs to also include this career readiness element to it. And guess what, um, you know, in 1997, I ran for governor and I went to visit 250 schools. Try that out for, you wanna have fun. That, that was like one of the great joys of my life. So I was going to schools three, three times a, you know, a day basically and I saw everything there was to see. I learned how to sneak in, I learned how to like veer the, they always wanted me to go to the AP literature court, you know, class where the, all the kids were brilliant. And, and uh, uh, in one class in Miami, the, the um, next door to the AP literature course that I couldn't get out of, it was a very stimulating conversation. There was a rumble, literally. There was like a, they were throwing chairs at each other in the, ch in the <laughs> room next door. So you learn a lot, uh, but back then, the so-called voc ed, you know, uh, part of education was a totally different track and it was relevant, it was important, but it, was, it required lower, it, was, it had lower expectations attached to it. What we're in now requires actually higher expectations and higher uh, critical thinking skills and higher uh, aptitudes. I mean, so it's not a dual track system, if you get this right, it's, these are options that parents and students should have. And um, if you wanna be a welder, uh, or you want to be a, in, in the trades or an information technologist, the skills that are required require a rigorous learning environment. It's not sitting in the back of the, you know, in the back of the high school with uh, the one beleaguered uh, voc ed guy. 
That's not the world we're in anymore. And one of the things that you all have done, the legislature has done, it, which has been phenomenal, I think, is uh, bonus in the school grading system, put, put uh, bonuses for students that, that, bonuses for teachers, which is, I think, your bill, right, last year? Your bill, whoever's bill, whoever, who's taking credit for this thing? <laughs> Good. So you, you bonus the teachers that take these, uh, that teach these courses and you're giving nationally recognized certificates as well as getting high school credit. That could be expanded dramatically and I think that, that's the better approach and you're absolutely right that it has to be, that's a place where Florida has lagged behind but we have a huge opportunity to kind of catapult beyond where, uh, where other states are because there are a lot of these states that have a long tradition of voc ed, have big voc ed uh, you know, departments, and they don't want to give it up. Just saying back, rewind the tape. I mean, people don't want change, particularly in these monopolies. So since our, we have a lighter footprint in this space, we could, we could design ours for the 21st century. I would encourage you to, to, uh, to do it. All right, one last question, Representative Sullivan. Thank you, and thank you, Governor, for being here today. You talked about personalized learning, and I'm a huge fan of that. I'm actually running that bill this year. Um, and last year at the Excellent Education Conference, you had the creator of Khan Academy there. Yeah. And he talked about learning gaps, which I found really fascinating. And so my question is to the point of how or would it be appropriate in the public school setting to use Khan Academy in a way, and how to help in those learning gaps? I mean, College Board has used it, and with the PSAT we use it and the way it's connected in that, but how do you see also um, Khan Academy changing the face of education? So Khan Academy actually has, uh, um, they've had a pilot, I don't know if it's no longer, it's been two years in existence or three, so it's probably not a pilot anymore. They operate in the East Palo Alto School District, which is a lower income, it's not the fancy Palo Alto, it's the lower income area, and they're in the classroom with this uh, customized learning model that is uh, pretty fascinating if you think about when, what, I, what I thought, the take home of that, that, that speech, uh, the one that I, I think it was the same one, was that what they found with all this massive amount of data, I think how many people go online for Khan Academy, millions of data points, and what they find, found was that it's not, le learning's not linear, that a low achieving kid is a low achieving kid, stays a low achieving kid forever, and high achieving kids stay high, that sometimes it's the mastery of a particular concept and then they get back on track really quick. So if you're trying to teach the median, you miss those, you miss those gaps and then, then you kind of have this cascading effect of where teachers um, kind of lose the, uh, the, the students get further and further behind and it makes it harder to catch up. So what he found was there could be one concept, you get that right and you immediately get back on track. That customized kind of learning experience can be applied um, can be taught um, by Khan Academy. I mean, if you called up Sal Khan and said, we're prepared to fund a, uh, a similar kind of thing that you're doing in, in, um, in California, come on over, he would do it. Um, or we can create our own version of that. There are other entrepreneurs that understand this as well. But the, what you have to do, I, the one thing that I would be leery of after you prove this concept out, I'm, pilots are great because you know, some of my great ideas turned out to be not so great, so doing it on a pilot basis is a smart thing to do. Uh, but once you've proven it out, don't isolate the funding in a line item because the next group of people come and they don't, it's not their idea and they kill it. This is not about that. This is like, if, if it works, and I believe it will, fully integrate it into the funding formula so that it is a matter of fact. And, and a, a or, or give three school districts, I mean, we're, we're dealing with, uh, there's a pilot right now underway where they're studying this stuff, but it's way too slow. I'm, I don't know. I, there's got to be a way to get, there's got to be some bold uh, superintendent that's ready to just let it rip on behalf of uh, student learning and w would be willing to put aside all these encumbrances to prove it out quickly. My ideal situation would be to find a school district with a school board that would back a passionate uh, superintendent leader that would hire the best you know, principals and have four or five schools that just create the 21st century learning environment and prove that every child can learn far more than what we think they can learn today. And this would definitely be part of that, I think. So good luck with the bill. I got dinner with the superintendent Monday. 
Maybe, Which maybe one? I'll bring that up. Carvalho. Okay. <laughs> I hope I hope I hope he bites. Well, Governor, thank Good you again. Uh, uh, what a pleasure it is to have you here for all your contributions to this state. We're, we're truly indebted to you, uh, and thank you for spending time yeah. with us here today. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Have fun doing this.